Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so uh, when I was, since uh, Carol talked about that, uh, when I was at the FCC, I would usually say this uh, opinion may or may not represent the, uh, the opinion of the FCC. I'm actually pretty positive that this opinion will not represent the opinion of the FCC. <laughs> Indeed, it will be about 180 degrees opposed. So with that warning, um, let me proceed. So let me talk give a little bit of history uh, in that. And I do want to provide a little bit of kind of historical background, because we often talk about the idea of open internet and neutrality uh, as something which is a new conflict or a new issue. But we've actually been dealing with related topics for quite a number of decades, actually probably 75 years in this. And I won't go through all of those. I, but for example, one of the issues that we've been dealing with in the network neutrality, open internet debate is as to who is allowed to attach devices to a precious network. Uh, and that's a problem that goes back to 1956, where we had actually law firm uh, by a company called Hushaphone versus the United States government. Uh, Hushaphone was a mechanical attachment, which allowed you to uh, protect privacy. Um, so in the pre-digital age, privacy was simply keeping somebody from literally eavesdropping as opposed to electronically eavesdropping uh, in that. I, we've had other discussions, which again are very relevant and probably going to be one of the foundations of any lawsuit that ensues given the current discussion. Namely, in 1966 and a little bit later, uh, we had the computer inquiries at the FCC, which allow this dealt with this integration of telecommunication functionality and information technology as it was emerging. Now, that was in a different environment. You had a monopoly, AT&T, that you were trying to constrain. But it was very much the same kind of initial set of questions. How do you separate out a more regulated monopoly or near monopoly environment from a environment that you wanted to foster innovation that was uh, much more competitive uh, and so on. So um, the also the discussion about how we divide these different functions, again, date back to kind of what was known as the second computer inquiry in 1979. So again, we're talking 40 years roughly ago, where we, there was this attempt made, and we've been having this debate, and I'll be reflecting that a little bit later, on how do we divide a network into a common substrate that should be available on non-discriminatory terms in a stuff that is maybe more traditional, unregulated commercial type of activity. And again, this has gone on in the latest uh, attempt was then made in 1996 in the Telecom Act, which is really the last uh, attempt by Congress to deal with that, is namely the definition of kind of telecommunication services and information services. So we've had this debate, even though it seems new, although for many of us it's no longer quite as new, uh, for decades. And so that may give you kind of a indication that this is a hard discussion in many ways. So again, this is not a new concern. Uh, this is a paper, I won't go through all of that. Um, read it. This is a paper from 1985, where exactly the idea is and distinguish between common carriers, broadcasts, cable operators, and private radio service. Um, the act, this is pre-96, offers little guidance, although this may be a reason for its durability, I struggled uh, to use old regulatory categories for new services. Again, this is 1985. The commercial internet didn't really exist. Uh, internet was a, a university research type of affair. But the themes are the same. Uh, as in, we've struggled with this issue of how do we treat the internet uh, as in this old, and how do we bucket it and all that. Now, I would say we is, this is a particularly US American fascination. Uh, no other country that I'm aware of is having that debate. Uh, this is, I mean, they all just say, oh yeah, internet, 
just packet version of all telecommunication network. No other country is having a debate as to whether internet is a telecommunication service. So this is a uniquely American debate, but it is a uniquely American debate. So let me skip that. So it's also one where you see a, a number of kind of things that are happening that helps in putting that in perspective. So we had earlier versions, uh, Brand X Supreme Court uh, and cable modem order that was early version of separation, the open internet order, where we've had very different in, environments. So when, for example, we first started to have a discussion about what obligations internet service providers had and whether they were an information service that was uh, different to regulatory environment versus a uh, telecommunication service, the cable companies and others, we were basically in the AOL dial-up era where internet service was just one more thing you did on AOL or CompuServe, all these other services that don't really exist anymore. And so when we look back at decisions and at discussions, we have to recognize that at the time, the cable companies had I mean, a vision, in particular when they got into the cable business, uh, cable modem business, of offering information services equivalent to AOL because they were competing with AOL at the time where you would I mean, get your pre-web page type of thing. In there. So when we look at these discussion, we also need to look at what the historical context was of that. Okay, let me again, and I'm going to just, this is for background for those of you who have not had this discussion, uh, because it matters in that sense. So the, the Telecom Act gives us some guidance uh, in definition what that is. And so it defines telecommunication mean as potential regulatory, regulatory concern uh, as the transmission between or among points specified by the user of information of the user's choosing without change in the form or content of the information sent and received. So presumably whoever drafted that, and I'm sure this had had long precedence in various places, felt this was a pretty clear definition um, of what telecommunication is, meaning the regulated part of what the FCC at the time was supposed to be doing. Uh, again, this was in the environment of largely a voice telephone network versus what we're doing now in terms of the internet. Uh, so the idea was you could cleanly separate out pure transmission from the processing of information which at the time nobody wanted to, even then, nobody wanted to regulate AOL or any of these online services. So the network neutrality, the open internet type of debate is largely to some extent as to whether you can separate out these notions of pure transmission. Now, this is, at least if you believe to adhere to the law, I mean, if you have a notion that no telecom service should be regulated either, you don't have to have a debate. But if you believe, as the current FCC does, that the internet is not a telecommunication service, you essentially have to work around that definition. Uh, in that. And the problem that the definition has is, as probably any engineer said, that even though it makes a very clear statement in terms of what the choices are, namely form or content, we've had, even in, the, in networks that everybody hopefully agrees is a telecom network, namely the voice network, we've had form or content changes forever. I don't know why the drafters didn't recognize that, but we've had protocol translations between SS7 and legacy signaling, at the time, legacy signaling protocols. We've had a law MULA for those of the old telecom folk translations, as long as digital voice has been around. In that. So this has always been something which was never quite as clean and didn't really meet those definitions. So we've had these definitional problems for a while, and we're now getting, unfortunately, getting stuck in definitions, which if we had applied that, there would never have been any U.S. telecommunication network. No network ever deployed meets the strict definition of a telecommunication network. I'll skip that. Okay, let me go to... So the problem that we have is that we don't really have clean 
protocol interface definition as we think about it. So we today don't really think about networks as kind of a, a translational type of things. We think of it as protocol layers. Uh, that's what we learn in inter-networking classes, Carol and others and I teach. Uh, is what everybody hopefully remembers, at least until the final exam, is the layers of a protocol stack. That's something that we can all recognize as I mean, usefully stable. We found a version of IP that pretty much provides the same service for 50 years now, roughly speaking, and there's not much debate as to what that is, but the law does not use these type of engineering definitions. So, for example, if somebody had written into the law, said that, oh, we, we, man, anything of layer three and below is regulated, and anything above layer three is not, well, I think we would at least have a more informed or at least a, le a, le a debate, which is less kind of angels on a pin-like in some cases, uh, in that, namely, as to whether caching and DNS suddenly turn a telecom network into an information service. So we had, and this is the usual kind of instructive beyond just simply the notion of a particular debate, is this issue that you have terms which seem technical, but unfortunately, maybe by good intent because they're meant to be, product, meant to be technology independent, turn out to be uh, kind of left to interpretations which change more based on the political leanings of the court or the FCC than it does on anything that changes fundamentally. Uh, based on particular kind of technology artifact idea in that. So for example, uh, the law defines as something called protocol processing uh, in that as being kind of a particular, uh, making it a non-telecom service. What is that exactly? Is a law to mu law? Is that protocol processing? Yeah, probably. Is Monsanto to uh, ATM or whatever? ATM to is that protocol processing? Yeah, we turn those as protocol, but that's not what they meant. Except we don't know that. They don't know that anymore. So we, that is a problem. Uh, the problem also is that many of the things, and other countries struggle with that as well, is that we think of these things like upper layer protocols, like email. Um, you can take the definition, just for fun purposes, is try to match the email to uh, the first definition. Uh, fits pretty well. I mean, uh, email is between among points, shows my user email address. Um, Without change in form or content, generally speaking, that's true. Uh, and so email is a telecom service if you can look at it somewhat askew. So we have a fundamental problem. Again, only the US got itself into that particular pickle. This is not a kind of um, universal thing. Other countries seem to avoid that, but that's what we're stuck with. Okay, so I'm. Let me, again, just to give a little bit of history for those of you who haven't followed that debate, is the, defin the definitional origins of the whole network neutrality open internet debate actually are quite old by now, even if you ignore kind of the really early ones that I mentioned earlier. So uh, Tim Wu, a law professor at Columbia, um, started, is generally credited with coining the term network neutrality. The idea is, as usual, much older than that, but uh, he wrote a seminal paper that described some of the concerns. I recommend, if you're interested in that topic uh, and are more academically inclined, reading it because it illustrates how the conditions that were there in 2003 are very different from what we're dealing with today. Some of the things haven't changed, but some of the things are quite different, particularly, as I will talk about, is what uh, Pecalius did at the time. So the idea, uh, which is actually has survived quite well, that um, this fundamental statement that essentially became the network neutrality, that the internet does not favor one application over others. Um, that in and of itself, the internet is not um, biased in that. That's, as was of us done technical, is kind of true at some level, but you can certainly find ways that it is not true in terms of um, TCP behavior and, and so on. 
And one other notion is that is actually quite relevant is that the internet is also a modern term, namely a platform. We talk about that a lot. We now think mostly of Google and Facebook and so on as a platform, namely a platform that actually uh, brings together two markets, generally speaking, namely consumer market and uh, the provider market. And the paper was reasonably clear on making that point, namely that it is not just about a consumer perspective, but also about uh, a market perspective. Again, this is about the money aspect. That this is a market that allows providers of content um, non-discriminatory access to consumers, and consumers allow non-discriminatory access to the content. So again, I, the notion of absolute equality of performance was never really given. Again, lawyers might not have understood that quite in detail. We know that my internet is biased, so to say, against just by technology in that TCP is latency sensitive. You get lower throughput if you're further away, for this, uh, all things being equal. Uh, different applications like the internet more or not. This is for those of us doing real-time stuff. We know that packet loss has different effect on voice uh, in some sense. And I'm going to say what something which sounds wrong, but it's probably right, is voice is less packet loss sensitive than TCP. We learned the opposite, but try running voice on 10% packet loss, you can do that. Try running TCP on 10% packet loss, good luck with that. Um, you're gonna get timeouts and everything else and you can get one packet per round trip time if you're lucky. Uh, and so it is in many ways a non, even the same performance, non-neutral in the sense. So uh, if you look at, again, trying to nail down a little bit what we're talking about, what exactly are we talking about um, when we talk about network neutrality? Uh, and so again, Tim Wu didn't really provide a clear definition. So Wikipedia is as good as any, uh, as you can, easy to cite, you used to cite like a dictionary, but we don't have those anymore. I, so or, I, and it's a Wikipedia of a traditional notion. So the principle advocates what they claim, no restriction by internet service providers and governments on content side platform, the side of the kinds of equipment that may be attached and the modes of communication. And this is based on, again, um, an early attempts of that, which was done by the uh, FCC under Powell in 2004 and 2005. So he, a previous chairman, uh, Michael Powell, gave a talk uh, on that, which was presumably based on uh, the Roosevelt uh, notion of the uh, three freedoms, uh, here now the four internet freedoms, namely uh, the basic idea was, and this was codified in a statement, not a regulatory rulemaking, um, access for lawful content of the choice, uh, run applications of the choice, connect to choice of legal devices, and competition among network providers. So again, you see both aspects of that particular conundrum, namely, or that particular debate, namely access from a consumer perspective, the first three axes, and the final one, namely the competition aspect, which has gotten lost a little bit along the way. That's really no longer quite part of the same discussion. Again, this wasn't really framed as network neutrality debate. This was framed as internet freedoms debate. So it's a little bit broader uh, than that. Generally, and this is kind of what people used to say, kind of as a short definition, uh, that if you'd ask, is that network neutrality is essentially any lawful content, any lawful application, any lawful device, any provider. Right? That's kind of a short version that you often hear uh, in that. Again, giving some historical perspective, the idea, and this is often used as an alternative, is network transparency. So that the network itself is like glass. It doesn't really care as to what you view through the glass uh, in that. And so this goes back to the, one of the early RFCs, 1958, I mean, number RFC 1958, um, which must be like pre-2000, I don't have the exact date, uh, where you, architectural principles of the internet uh, that the goal is connectivity, the tool is the internet protocol, and the intelligence is end-to-end, -end, uh, rather than hidden in the network. So that is 
general connectivity, not application specific uh, in that. And, but that debate early on in the internet started to look into things which were became known as middle boxes, things of other things that were starting to interfere with this particular fact. But a little bit later, there is indeed a statement, again, this predates the modern internet and network neutrality debate, is that there is a network of transparent that is oblivious or transparent that don't really require change, that you can deploy new applications without requiring changes to the core and as the essential characteristic to that. So we've been kind of trying to get that elephant of a open, transparent, neutral, whatever internet from various dimensions for many, many years, for decades now. And they're all, none of those are wrong. They all just capture some of the more technology, some of the more market-oriented, some of the more legal definition of the same problem. So if you look at this transparency and neutrality uh, overlapping, they're not quite the same. So you could have a transparency which allows quality of service differentiation, for example. Um, and it wouldn't be neutral, but it would be transparent in that sense. So they're not quite the same, but they're related. So why would, I mean, these all seem like relatively non-controversial type of statements. I mean, this seems like, my, Chairman Powell was a Republican appointed uh, chairman, was probably not seen as a lefty liberal, uh, and didn't seem particularly controversial at the time. And so, and the transparency type of things, probably not terribly controversial as a statement of the internet. Uh, in that. So, why would somebody not want to do that, uh, in that from a carrier or some other perspective? And indeed, from a carrier perspective or from a government run or government influence type of network, there are actually kind of three motivations that carriers might have not to think that's a, such a hard idea. Uh, so one is a political motivation. I won't spend much time on that. One, which is the China, great firewall of China, uh, is uh, that you might want to suppress undesirable opinions on that either because you don't have those opinion or you believe that the government, you want to curry favor with the government that, you, um, that you're under, um, or that you have some internal issue. So there was a Canadian, I think, web uh, carrier that started blocking temporarily a union website who it was in dispute with uh, over a labor contract issue. So it had a very kind of a local one. Or there was some controversy about, I think it was Verizon blocking uh, abortion-related SMS messages as being political advocacy. So that has occurred even kind of in Western traditional kind of liberal uh, countries uh, in that. So it's not completely just Chinese thing. The biggest one is economic issues. Um, so the early disputes, and I'll get more into that, about uh, network neutrality with carriers were essentially about competition. Uh, com competing services that would indeed uh, compete with a carrier service that it wanted to offer. So voice of IP or video, to over the top video at different eras were seen as competing with core services that the carrier wanted to also provide. So vertical integration versus external competition. Um, or that you want to leverage your pricing power as a carrier, so you have access to valuable consumers that use you for the internet access, and so you don't want to have the OTT provide or leverage that consumer base without paying you a fee for that particular one. Or, and this is one I get back to, which is a little trickier, uh, to deal with is we traditionally have sold, or carriers have traditionally sold their network in essentially the same network in two very different markets, namely a business market and a consumer market. And I've done this in a variety of ways, just like airlines have business class and I mean, tourist class, as it used to be called many years ago. Um, because of different needs as far as and price differentiation and willingness to pay. And in many ways, kind of a network neutrality debate makes that harder. 
Uh, that's often not something that gets brought up, but it becomes increasingly problematic for carrier perspective because, for example, the ability to attach a server, which was a very early version and actually continues to be a version of a network neutrality debate, is a network neutrality debate, but it's largely about, hey, I'm selling a customer a service to the business community for probably 10 times as much as I'm selling it to the consumer. I don't want the consumer to suddenly reuse their consumer line as a business service. We've done that in telephone service. We've done it in others one. How do I deal with that uh, in, in a neutral way? So carriers might not want that, might be ability to differentiate or discriminate or however you want to phrase it. Uh, in that. And you can do non-tariff barriers, APIs and so on, which I won't talk about much. But there's also a bunch of issues that I won't spend much time on uh, that are actually a little bit, uh, have been lumped under the network neutrality debate uh, at some point or another. Just to illustrate this, this is actually more than just packet blocking and so on. So for example, um, should it be okay that a service provider redirects unresolvable domain names to a landing page where they get advertising dollars, which many carriers do? Uh, in that, as opposed to returning a no domain type of thing. Should they be able to translate content to a lower resolution video? Is that a neutrality? Should they be able to block transport protocols other than UDP or TCP, uh, SCTP or something like that? Residential web services. Is it okay if I run a web server on, at my home location on that? Is that a neutrality violation? Spam filtering. Is that something where um, it is a concern? Or, and this I don't think it exists anymore, there actually was a provider uh, in New York City that offered a DSL connection, literally known as koshernet, uh, that provided a orthodox Jewish kosher web experience. So it filtered out anything that, according to whoever advised this ISP, was not seen as something that they Orthodox Jewish customers would want to see. Is that, if done by the ISP, is that a violation or is that even implicated by that? Um, if you reset the type of service bits in that, modify the protocol, is that a problem? So based on, if you don't support IPv6, is that a neutrality violation? So you can get fairly far apart and I won't want to do that and I just wanted to illustrate uh, the discussion is more than just simply a can I discriminate based on packets type of thing. Namely, what are the oblig rights and obligations of a carrier in that, and which parts do you implicate in kind of its broad umbrella of an open internet versus uh, more just commercial concerns or technology development concerns. And, and I'll give you one example that we actually have quite a few traditionally outside the United States, um, providers which, I mean, you would at least argue whether this is a good idea or not, uh, that would probably not meet any kind of traditional definition of openness. So this is a provider, Optus, in Australia. So they provide unlimited access within Australia to Facebook, Twitter, eBay, MySpace, um, this dates back a while, uh, LinkedIn and Foursquare, and that's what you get. Right? And so you have a distinct discrimination, namely by zero rating. Otherwise, you only get two gigabytes of general type of internet traffic. But you zero rate very specific applications, whether they pay, Optus, I do not know. But that's a notion of a non-neutral version, namely a home network where Facebook is easy. Otherwise, you get two gigabytes per month. Right? So it's, this is not a theoretical concern. Again, we have two markets that we're talking about, and indeed, if you've been following, um, I don't know if you've been looking at that, is California recently passed some uh, fairly stringent network neutrality rules, and the biggest controversy is actually not about blocking, it's about the two-sided market. Namely, the market between kind of the home side on the right side and the wider area providers where the transit networks and the CDNs and the content providers interact with the ISP. So you have a two-sided market, meaning it is a market where the ISP is the market maker, if you like, between these two. They get paid by the consumers on the right-hand side, but they also want to get paid by 
be producers. They want to essentially have a stocking fee or whatever you allow you want to use for the content that is being provided by the consumers. Uh, so you now have a market question, namely should I be ISP be able at the inter-exchange point charge for that particular service for delivering content to the consumers on the right hand side? And if so, what? This, by the way, is an old debate, and it's interesting that carriers actually come out on two different sides on that. So this is the same version, and if you look at it, uh, for those of us old in, tel in telephone business, of intercarrier compensation, namely p paying somebody else to carry your traffic, uh, and not in the telephone world. In that world, the carriers, the big carriers, all think it's a terrible idea, and we should all get rid of it. Uh, in the new world of the internet, everybody should pay for ac access networks to deliver their traffic. So it depends on where you sit, depends on where you stand. That's what I said. So we've always had kind of two views of the general discussion. So we had we kind of what you might call the more um, on the liberal side of the open internet advocates that take a fairly uh, non-compromising type attitude. Namely, one is you should have no prioritization of content at all. There should be flat rates, essentially no charging based on volume, and you should be applied to all kinds of networks. And then you have the free market advocates, which are currently clearly in, uh, in, this, in control, uh, which basically make arguments that tend to be of some version of that, uh, I mean, some one or more arguments of that type, besides the definitional argument, as in, this is, internet is not a telecom network um, type of thing, as in, even kind of, we, we want to regulate, but we are not allowed to kind of thing, or, I mean, even though that's not a terribly convincing stance in my personal view. But in any event, there's no real problem, um, as in we haven't really had much in terms of violation of internet neutrality, however defined, particularly if you define it very narrowly. Blocking is, for example, not very common. Uh, plus, it's, I mean, it's a free market. I should allow any business arrangement, however constructed uh, in that. So that's certainly kind of a version of it's my network. I mean, I built it. Uh, it's not yours to decide what, you, what I do with it. And if something really should go wrong, we just use the FTC and anti-monopoly laws uh, to deal with that. Uh, in that particularly, the FTC has rules that allow you to do unfair and deceptive practices. Yes, please. So my question is exactly un about the unfair and deceptive practice. So uh, to what extent would, for example, you showed all the things that a carrier might do, uh, is not disclosing those things, could that ever be considered unfair and deceptive? Or does it matter that I told you I'm doing all that stuff and you bought it anyway? Yes, and so, uh, and this is your indirectly hinting at one of the core debates on, in the current one, namely the current FCC makes a claim uh, that in the 2017 rules, that, uh, 2018 rules, that you have a model where disclosure prevents, so you have essentially a two-step process, namely disclosure prevents most bad behavior uh, in that, and if it doesn't, then anti-monopoly laws would step in, as in because you just you commit some unspecified violation of uh, the, competi I mean, uh, the competition laws in that. Yes. So the idea is, and that the FTC would step in if you. So there is a rules that you're not allowed to do false, quote, false advertisement in that. And so if you say you're neutral and you're not really, then you would get caught on that. Again, that uh, assumes one thing is it implicitly or explicitly assumes that consumers have choices. I mean, as opposed to what um, as to which provider they can choose. Uh, and it assumes that the anti-monopoly laws actually apply. Many people doubt that. Uh, and that seems certainly unlikely. To your knowledge, that's never been applied. Like I sold you internet service and didn't support IPv6 and nobody's ever... <laughs> I'm unaware of any... I mean, so let me... Uh, so I'm unaware of any FTC action along those lines. In other countries, however, uh, I know Great Britain, there have been um, essentially disclosure violation or in other countries where uh, ISPs got... Um, 
at least reprimanded for being inaccurate in the disclosure of the speed that they were offering in particular. So it's not unheard of that consumer authorities do that. And there have been, um, not at the FTC level, there have been kind of the advertising bureau, or whatever it's called, that uh, deals with disputes between advertisers. They have had disputes between cable companies and fires in particular where um, I forget who was suing whom. The uh, fires were making claims about the network speed that uh, the cable companies didn't like or vice versa. So you've had disclosure related issues, but it's not been very much common because unless you're a small ISP, hopefully you have lawyers which are good enough to make sure that you actually disclose it. Now, there was, I mean, I'll say some of it, at the time this was not an FCC matter, it was, I mean, not an FTC matter, but an FCC matter, was the Comcast resetting peer-to-peer -peer services was partially also implicated as a um, undisclosed, what would be called network management, wasn't the terms really weren't um, used all that much in that time. Um, technology. So this has come up, but it's been somewhat of a sideshow uh, in practice. Okay. So one of the things, and this goes, I'm trying to narrow down to kind of the economic side of it a little bit, is when we talk about the network neutrality debate, one of the difficulties in terms of having actually a discussion uh, is that you can have a very narrow discussion, namely this is all just about money type of thing. And I should point out, even though this is kind of a title, my thesis of my uh, presentation, there are other considerations that aren't complete, that we shouldn't dismiss. So traditionally, uh, regulation of communication services, radio and TV in particular, were not about money, it was about civic participation um, and cultural issues and so on. So this is but freedom to read and write produce content and consume content, if you want to call it that way, for independent of whether there's any monetary value associated to that. So the idea is that blocking is bad, not just because some company can't make money on the internet, it is blocking is bad or just other forms of discrimination because it prevents me from expressing a viewpoint or me from uh, partaking in a viewpoint uh, in that. Uh, and so that is, a non-monetary, it doesn't depend on whether this is a commercial service or not, whether it's any kind of, so for example, antitrust wouldn't apply in that particular case because there's no commercial issue uh, implicated in that. And there's an economic um, opportunity argument, again, and this comes up indirectly in the current debate a lot. So there's usually two arguments made, namely a narrow one of this is about investment in kind of the infrastructure itself. But by now, what you might call the edge economy, kind of the usual suspects, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Netflix, um, the Amazons, and so on of the world, cloud services, Microsofts of the world, are far bigger than the transmission component. There's far more money involved directly and indirectly, not so much because of cloud services, but dependency as in my Amazon, not the web service side, but Amazon, the business couldn't exist without the internet. So the economic activity that depends on the internet is far, far greater by definition as the internet service that we pay itself. So we have to be careful when we do these economic analysis as to whether we're talking simply about on uh, kind of the internet economy as routers and switches and transmission lines, or really all the things that depend on it. Indeed, this is a classical discussion, and, and I don't want to get too far afield, is in other areas, railroads that kind of have had some of the same openness discussion as we're now having about the internet, is very much the discussion is not so much about the Railroad itself is that without a railroad, farmers couldn't get their wheat to market, and so they depended on the railroad to do that, and the wheat value was clearly higher than the railroad value, otherwise you wouldn't ship it by railroad. Right? So the, in the earlier orders, it's the content application service providers. In that. 
Yeah? And there's also thirdly a technical motivation, namely the idea was you don't want to have a cableization, as some people call it, of the internet, where or a Netflixation, I guess it's the modern version of it, namely where you have to have several subscriptions to the internet, just like if you want to watch a movie, you have to have Netflix and Hulu and whatever, Amazon, uh, and if you watch your favorite show because they all have non-overlapping content, uh, or not partially overlapping content. So that's a value. We want to maintain a single internet as opposed to having to piece together your non-blocked parts of the internet. So there's one additional version, namely the freedom of speech model uh, in that you have. is and So this is a new argument, uh, which is relatively recent. Uh, is so the uh, internet is private entities, so freedom of speech is something which restricts the government. First Amendment is a government issue uh, in and of itself that the government can't restrict the freedom of speech. Okay? So the other thing that has been happening economically is that it used to be pretty simple. We used to have a very clear definition between kind of content providers on one side and kind of somewhat ISPs, forget about online, American online, uh, a little bit as a hybrid. Uh, and ILEX and CLEX and telephone service and all that. They were not commingled largely. Right? But now we have all kinds of vertically integrated services. Almost, it's like the telecom business is a strange business that it seems like none of the companies that are in the telecom business actually want to be in the telecom business. It's like they all have my kind of these, I mean, we'd rather be at I mean, whatever Academy Awards receptions and at whatever, uh, router conventions, I can see why, but I mean, this is mine. If you look at Comcast owns DreamWorks and the NBC Sports and uh, what have you, and theme parks and AT&T owns HBO and CNN, and Verizon wants to be in the advertising business, they want to compete with Google, and so on. Okay? So we have this additional thing which didn't really, again, leaving some AOL issues aside, didn't really exist in the old world. Again, and most ISPs were not AOL in those days, but your local ISP dial-up uh, type of ISP. Uh, we also have a highly concentrated market in the residential field. So the top 10, 12 ones have essentially all, so with 96 million households, with about 115 million households in the US total, are uh, served by these relatively small number of cable and telephone companies. So we have a pretty, unlike in the early internet days when we had lots of ISPs, mom and pop ISPs, they just basically don't exist anymore. So you go down very fast after you hit kind of Cincinnati Bell, you're going down into tens, 100,000 type of subscribers as opposed to kind of a 15 million or 26 million subscribers. Are those landline numbers? Yeah, those are landline companies. And obviously, the concentration is even higher in the mobile field where four companies, or maybe three, depending on what the FCC decides, um, are going to have 90-whatever, have 8% of subscribers, if you don't count captive MBNOs. Uh, uh, so we have a very concentrated market, um, certainly in that. And the number of competitors that you have available, depending on the speed, also is typically pretty small, one or two um, that you have in most places, at least for the higher speeds uh, in that. And the three competitors that you have, and it's not counting satellite, uh, are largely fictitious, rarely have more than, than two. So when we look at a little bit of a discussion, again, this makes the network neutrality open in a discussion challenging because it has morphed. Nobody tells you that. I mean, they all say it's the same thing, but actually what was in, on the early 2000s, like when Tim Wu wrote the, the article, the type of thing that he mentioned in his articles of what AT&T and other providers at the time were doing is you were not allowed to have multiple, wife, uh, multiple attachments to your home network, one computer only, no Wi-Fi, um, and you were not allowed to run a VPN on your home network because that was considered a business use. Nobody does that anymore, but that was the kind of concerns that you had uh, in, in those days. Uh, in, uh, and then in 2010, uh, kind of a notion was changed to kind of a no blocking, no discrimination, transparency type of world in that. And then more 2015, suddenly in addition to those, actually the people, thing that people worry about were suddenly privacy 
uses of data, interconnection, zero weighting, and tethering um, as a possibility uh, of a potential concern of mortality. And it changed to um, in 2015. And then I uh, have a kind of a notion that we don't need any of that type of stuff. In that. So how can you be non-neutral in a variety of ways? And so again, you have to distinguish between application layers, transport, and network layers. So it is really at all middle layers, so to say, of the protocol stack. Uh, in that. So you can do deep packet inspection, you can do uh, block transport protocols and ports, you can block IP addresses, you can do zero rating, all of that. So it is really more than just a single layer issue. So we've had, like I said, a number of cases that change over time. So what we talk about in 2003 is very different than what we're talking about in 2018 as concerns. So, and this is often what makes your debate a little bit bad faith is that service providers say, we no longer do the things that we fought about in 2003 because we've moved on, right? And so why are you worried about it? Well, because the concerns change as well. So for example, uh, in uh, I mentioned Wi-Fi was uh, outlawed, so to say, by the appropriate use policy of AT&T in 2003, 2002, okay? They don't do that anymore. They don't care. It's not a concern. Madison River, one of the famous predecessor cases, it was blocking port 5060 of a support because they didn't like voice of IP competition. Again, not a major concern anymore uh, in that. Uh, we, uh, TCP, the Comcast one, for BitTorrent traffic. Well, BitTorrent isn't that big a deal anymore, et cetera. Uh, AT&T blocking FaceTime, they don't do that anymore either uh, on um, some wireless services, et cetera. Uh, some system some issues persist, like I said, interconnection is as old a neutrality and openness issue as the telephone system. I mean, this goes back to the early days of AT&T, and that seems to be one that will likely stay with us uh, for quite a while. And I'll talk about zero rating uh, as well. Um, since I'm a little late, let me uh, kind of not go through the great detail of the historical evolution, but we basically had kind of three modern phases of the open internet regulation at the FCC. We had the 2010 rules, uh, which were basically no, tra no uh, transparency, no blocking, and no unreasonable discrimination. And those were based on a notion where it tried, the FCC tried at the time to avoid stepping into the telecom versus information services debate and used a somewhat obscure provision of the act to say that this is necessary to further the internet. And the court said, after Verizon sued, um, the FCC said, nope, um, can't do that. The DC Circuit said, can't do that. Uh, so they basically, transparency is OK under those rules, but you can't do things that look like a telecom service regulation uh, on that. Uh, so I said that. I, I skip that. Okay. In 2015, the FCC, I think, I would say somewhat hesitantly, as in it ran out of other options, I decided that the only way to get to the similar rules was to say explicitly what it had avoided at that up to that point, to declare the internet a telecommunication, also known as Title II service, uh, in that. So that made it similar to the old public switch telephone network uh, type of model for both mo uh, mobile and landline versions. Right? So the new rules in 2015 were very similar with some addition to paid prioritization, which had become a concern at the time, and some other rules, which I won't go into, general conduct rules and some enhanced transparency rules. Um, and those, again, were at the time, this was again the evolution in 2010, the mobile networks was largely voice and a little bit of web, web data. In 2015, it was clear that wireless services were used as a main internet access for many consumers, and so the rules were extended to those as well. Okay. Um, interestingly, uh, so this is a relatively recent one, is then uh, the FCC got sued, as always happens in these things. I mean, there's no open-ended rules where courts don't get involved uh, in that. And over two rulings, 
finally, almost in two to one decisions, BFCC's 2015 rules were upheld. Said, yep, they can do that. They're entitled to declare uh, the internet a telecommunication service in that. The last one, which is somewhat interesting because uh, you may have heard this name Kavanaugh uh, before. Uh, and so he was actually part of a dissent uh, for a secondary ruling where the carriers had said, uh, no, you have to actually rule en banc in a larger group uh, of judges on the whole DC circuit on this. And they said, no, you don't. Uh, and he disagreed with that. And he made a new argument, which really had not been somewhat, which had been somewhat limited in that up to that point, namely that the carriers actually have a First Amendment right to restrict what is on their network. That argument had not been widely, it had been made, but not widely made. So that's a new argument in that debate, namely that the carrier has a, um, just a First Amendment right to prohibit any speech that it doesn't like on the network, essentially obliviating the difference between a carrier type network, however defined, a neutral provider you like, and a uh, cable network or some other or a newspaper or a TV station or others that generally have been attached to First Amendment rights. So that's an interesting perspective, and it is quite possible that whatever the decision that comes out of the DC Circuit on the current rules will end up in the Supreme Court. So you can kind of guess how that is going to go. Let me just. Okay, the 2017 OI rules are really simple. They are not. Uh, so essentially in 2017, the new FCC said, forget about all of that. Um, we go back to some previous version, and they kept some version, I'm simplifying, of the 2010 uh, transparency rules in that. So that's what we're under currently, needless to say, they're getting sued uh, in Mozilla versus FCC, uh, and that's currently pending in the DC circuit. So the justification was that uh, it was a decrease in investment in the uh, in telecom uh, capital expenditures uh, based on uh, and was attributed to in 2014. As you can see between 2015, the new rules in 2016, between 77.9 and 76 billion dollars by major providers, and that was seen as this was indicating that those rules were bad. In the interest of time, I won't dissect that, but that's what. So what's next is, uh, this is going to get um, in, uh, in court, and uh, there's also kind of what happens depends on November 6th, namely depending on what Congress does. Uh, if the majorities change, they might decide to do something uh, that avoids this whole discussion, although people have been hoping for that for uh, roughly 10 years, and there's really not much of a sign there uh, in that. I mean, interestingly, 1996, the Telecom Act, which is really pretty regulatory, was a almost unanimous decision in the Congress. It's unimaginable that something similar would pass today's Congress. Just indicates how much change, particularly on uh, the conservative side, there has been since then. We actually have, and this is somewhat interesting, I, I would recommend you read the paper, is a um, uh, Schaffner at uh, Northwestern, Northeastern University has uh, done a bunch of experiments. Uh, carriers do seem to, despite their protestations, discriminate against different video services. So uh, this is the bandwidth that they um, give to different video services. Almost all of them now on mobile rate limit video services, and they do this very inconsistently, as in depending on which service you use, you get different rates. Uh, in that, which would certainly be typical of a violation. Uh, in that. Okay. California decided to do go their own way. Uh, they recently passed a uh, um, network neutrality law uh, that essentially uh, is the FCC 2015 rules plus. In particular, it regulates interconnection in that. So that is currently in court as well because the service providers uh, tell the want to sue California and say that they have no right to uh, pass these type of rules. Right. Uh, so as I said, we should think about network neutrality as beyond simply a narrowly about packets. This is really about what are the rights and responsibilities of consumers and broadband internet access providers. Are they just another business? 
that should be lightly regulated, if at all, and specifically for that particular, or are they something that has a um, kind of a particular gatekeeper role that deserves particular treatment? Yeah? And again, what are the economic incentives in this type of model? Uh, we competition in, this, in one, the two-sided market one, are they allowed to leverage customer information? It used to be that the regulator said, you have access to highly private information, but you should not leverage that for commercial gain. This is customer proprietary information that you have. Now, so should you allow quality of service? Um, should you, what do you deal with that? Uh, is that something that you should even worry about uh, in that? We don't have good charging mechanisms for that, so that makes it hard. Uh, we just don't have a good mechanism to charge differentially because most of the time the basic internet is just fine for quality of service. So let me give you some principles that might help longer term. So the first principle is one of user choice. I, we tend to forget that this is really in the end is meant to serve users. Uh, so as a metric for what is reasonable carrier behavior is if a user has plausible choice, it should probably be an okay thing. So if I can choose what quality of service I use for that particular traffic, I don't see much of a problem for carriers offering differentiated quality of service. It's one of the arguments that pro net, uh, I mean, kind of network neutrality opponents make. You can't do telesurgery if you have network neutrality. To me, that's a true straw man argument. Again, on a user choice model is if I choose to have high quality packets, I'm gonna pay for those if I want to. As a user, there's probably not much harm done. Uh, there's competition issues, but leaving those aside in that. So that allows uh, quality of service differentiation uh, in that. Users can designate the traffic. It's not the carrier picking Amazon over Skype. It's the user picking Amazon over Skype if that's what they prefer. Huh? The second one is, and this is a much more controversial one, I suspect, is longer term that we probably need some form of a, at least a virtual structural separation. The commingling of a content provider is inherently a conflict of interest to an infrastructure provider. It's just unavoidable. You just can't disentangle that. If I'm providing video service as a cable provider and I'm providing transport, which is used by competing providers of that same service, it's really hard to be neutral as a provider in that. It's just asking too much in that. So how do you do that? It's a hard problem. Uh, Great Britain is trying to solve this in some way, and other countries are. But that's probably the only long-term solution, completely infeasible under the current political circumstances, but that would avoid many of these economic debates because it avoids this inherent conflict between two worlds. And the third principle is transparency, not just in terms of performance, but also price. So let me conclude. I, so network neutrality is not one thing. It's not even three things. It's not just blocking transparency, non-discrimination, transparency type of thing. It's an economics and charging problem. Who can charge whom what? Uh, can I charge for specific applications? Can I zero rate particular application? Can I charge people who interconnect with me? It's a charging problem. Almost all the recent debates are really not about package discrimination. They are about price discrimination. It's all about who can charge what prices to whom, who should be allowed to charge what prices in an environment that has very limited competition uh, and has very limited ability for content providers to reach their customers except through the local ISP or two that they have. Again, it is made much more difficult, particularly in the US, by the lack of competition. I'm not, some people claim if we had competition, we didn't need network neutrality or open internet. I think that's wrong. There's a number, number of reasons and examples why that's not quite true, but it would make the problem much easier simply because the incentive structure would be better aligned. Right? And so long term, I think what the carriers have learned in the voice world actually is a pretty good uh, lesson, namely the notion to extract money from people who want to interconnect with you usually ends up badly. Uh, it has wrong incentives. 
decreases the incentive for interconnection. It gets to all kinds of monopoly pricing power issues in that. So what carriers have arrived at, the big carriers at least, for voice interconnection is probably the long-term right answer is that um, termination charges are just impossible to get right and fair uh, in that. So we should just give up on that particular one. It's not a major revenue source for the carriers. They don't mind getting a few million extra dollars, but it, billion dollar companies. Okay, with that, uh, kind of a wide ranging uh, discussion of 100 years, I'd gladly take questions, assuming there's time for that. Yeah, I would think we could take two or three questions and then I got a couple of announcements and then we have a reception and a raffle. So uh, let's take a couple questions. Right. Thank you. Uh, I see one of the biggest problems being uh, the fact that the reality is in a cable in the cable business, there's very few places where people have choice. And all the arguments that are made are always about, you know, giving consumers choice. But there, there is no choice. And um, maybe efforts uh, in providing choice would, um, would incent the service providers to then now start to um, provide some uh, differentiation. So I'm sort of curious your thoughts on on that, you know, the, the monopolization that's happened in the cable yeah, industry. Like I said at the end is the, the problem from a, it's always very difficult, let me phrase it slightly differently, regulating a non-competitive market is just really hard, right? even if you try really well. And I'm not saying previous FCC has had it right. They certainly could argue about the overhead and the difficulties of setting prices and all of that. I mean, all the stuff that um, we know is just hard to do. I, I will, mine, it is not, I think, empirical evidence illustrates that even in markets like European cellular markets uh, or South American cellular markets, even if you had multiple providers, there was what would be seen as network neutrality violation, like blocking voice of IP, because they all saw it in their interest not to allow competing voice services. Again, this is largely faded because I mean, they've probably given up on the voice side of charging a lot for that. So it's not a complete panacea, but it certainly more competition would make the problem much easier to solve. Now, I would argue that that's really not even the main incentive. I mean, the U.S. by now is among the most expensive countries for broadband in the world. I mean, there's only real a few developing countries that are more expensive for a higher speed broadband. Uh, and so competition would certainly help with that more and, and would probably be more have direct impact on that. But the problem, and this is what people always, I mean, I have a colleague, Bishan Mizra, who's been advocating, oh, we shouldn't have this all this network neutrality debate. We should just have more competition. Well, good luck with that. Um, namely, if people are objecting to not blocking traffic and having, relatively speaking, I mean, nobody had to dramatically change their business model after the 2015 rules. I mean, despite what people claim, there was really almost no practical impact, as far as I can tell, except on interconnection. And uh, the idea that the cable providers would just say, yep, we're just going to be, we're going to do structural separation or we're going to allow access to our fiber by competing providers and be like uh, BT Open Connect or whatever they call themselves and just have a, uh, is fantasy under any conceivable political arrangement in the U.S. Uh, so you actually have a strange thing that you have in some rural, in very small number of rural places, you have more competition because the fiber is provided by the municipality and they may have an open fiber and they have half a dozen different ISPs that actually provide services. But that doesn't happen anywhere in big cities. Okay? Yep, and this is very much along the lines I just said. There are some kind, I mean, small communities which have decided, um, and this is, came out of a somewhat different model, uh, namely, uh, it sidestepped the debate, is a municipality or electric utility for that matter, is that a good provider of um, internet services? And the answer is probably in many ways not, it's not their core competency, but they're very good about digging things and I mean, st opening streets and pulling stuff, and putting stuff in the ground on poles. And so the model that seems to be emerging is in, in small rural communities, not in 
big cities or in more densely populated areas is exactly a model where a local entity, municipality or electric utility or some other similar or a, third, when a utility specifically set up for that that only does fiber um, in that and then doesn't run anything above layer two uh, in that. Now, again, the existing uh, providers, none of them has said, uh, with one exception, and I've had a kind of conversation with somebody from a large provider, said, mm, we don't actually, we have this problem. This is we, none of the electric utilities actually want to, I mean, none of the carriers actually want to, seem to want to be in that business, is if there was a way to make that transition to say, hey, you can be a high-flying stock, you can pretend to be Google and Facebook, uh, and we'll relieve you of your transmission responsibility, uh, and we'll turn that back into widow and orphan stock, as in we pay dividends, but this is not a growth stock. Um, then maybe this will happen at some point, but we're not anywhere close to that. But the model has clearly been exercised and seems to be modestly successful, again, at, in rural areas. Thanks, thank you, Henning. I was, I was going to kind of bring up the, the rural issue, too. It seems like private-public partnerships are getting to be more popular as the communities are looking at it, saying, you know, if we, don't, if we don't put economic development money into the infrastructure, it's never going to hit our town. And but by the way, real good talk. If you uh, ever get tired of your job as engineering, you got to position there as a you know, re regulatory attorney. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, the model, and I'll make one quick comment, is the problem that I, so you, had, you have now many more electric utilities, particularly kind of rural electric cooperatives getting into the business of providing internet service, either open or not, many of them non-open, but any, in any event. And the big difference is the expected payback time. Uh, rural electric cooperatives don't expect to get paid back on their investment except maybe over 20, 50 years, and because they're not for profits, essentially cooperatives. Uh, uh, so they're, I mean, they're, kind of, they're not quite ones these please, they're not charities, but they are owned by their residents' members, so they're not, they're worried as much about economic development, they're not worried about paying dividend whole amount. We're not worried about paying dividends to that. So that model in rural areas is probably um, attractive simply because the payback time for fiber in rural areas is going to be essentially the lifetime of a fiber 20 years or so. Yep, very much so. Okay, thank you. We can continue these discussions at the reception.